Welcome to Mind Off 12. Will the House please come to order? My name is Tanisha Singh, and I will be serving as the Deputy Secretary General for Mind Off 12. Thank you all for being in attendance today, whether it be your first conference or your last. We hope this conference is as memorable for you as it is for us. Now it is with great pleasure that I introduce Mr. Lee, the principal of the middle school, to say a few words. Before we hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Samir Puri. Our school, Overseas Family School, is celebrating its 30th anniversary this academic year. From very humble beginnings in 1991, it has grown to about 2,200 students from pre-K right up to high school, with over 250 academic staff and representing over 60 different countries. We are all about inclusion and doing one's best at all times, regardless of where we come from, who we are, or the challenges we are faced with. The school's philosophy unites the different nations and cultures into one family unit. This philosophy coincides with the ideas behind our educational programs and promotes the habits of the IB learners. Collaboration, communication, open-mindedness, a bit of educated risk-taking, confidence building, and international mindedness. Over the last two years, we have all learned to adapt and overcome the challenges of the global pandemic. What we have gained is positive life experience to work with each other in a resilient and accepting society. I'm sure all of you will actively promote these habits and make these words come to life during the conference. Without you to dynamically give these words life, the words will mean very little. It is us as a collection of individuals that stand strong when we are united as one. Welcome to Overseas Family School and enjoy the conference. We are delighted to have Dr. Samir Puri with us here today to discuss the legacies of empire and their impact on international relations. Dr. Puri is a senior fellow in urban security and hybrid warfare at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Singapore. He holds a PhD from Cambridge University in international relations has worked at RAND and the British Foreign Office. In addition, he has lectured in the War Studies Department of King's College in London and also taught at Cambridge and John Hopkins. Dr. Puri is here to tell us about the concepts covered in his book, The Great Imperial Hangover, which looks at the legacy of empire in today's world. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Puri. It'd be great to hear you introduce some of the concepts of your book to our conference. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Tanisha. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about my book, The Great Imperial Hangover, which I think will be really relevant to some of your own personal stories, but also some of the new stories that you're reading about uh, as you follow what's happening in the wider world. So this is my book, and as you can see with the cover, I've uh, got different symbols that relate to different old empires. Uh, the Chinese dragon, the British lion, a double-headed eagle that's used by Russia. And the reason I've done this with my book is I wanted to cover the imperial legacies from all over the world and how they affect different people, depending on whether you're from Asia, whether you're from Europe, uh, whether you're from uh, Africa, the Middle East, where your background traces to. It's almost certainly the case that maybe not you personally, but your parents or your grandparents or great-grandparents would have experienced some kind of em empire that expanded, maybe took over, maybe helped to develop, maybe brought some misery to that part of the world, but also more recently the collapse of that empire. Since as I described in my book, over the course of the 20th century, empires as have been known since ancient times, since from the Bible, uh, had all collapsed in the 20th century. This kind of empire that directly occupied, administered colonies, or directly uh, annexed particular territories, this all came to an end. Uh, in Singapore, as I'm sure you know from your history studies, uh, the British Empire expanded and took over uh, what was the old kingdom of Singapore. And in 1819, Stanford Raffles thought this would make a great place for a port, a new port that could compete with Malacca further up the Malay Peninsula. And the British Empire took over Singapore in 1819, set it up, but by the 1960s, so not that long ago, certainly if you ask your parents and grandparents, they may well remember this themselves, uh, the British Empire gave up its control in Singapore, and Singapore became independent. Now just imagine all around the world there are different stories of conquest and independence that have played out, and for people from all over the world, different personal stories that relate to some of those historical experiences, 
and that somehow affect in sometimes quite indirect ways uh, their sense of identity today, but also the political world and social world that they live in. Thank you, Dr. Puri. We will now have a few questions from our middle school students. Dr. Puri, my question is, to what extent do you think the problems we face today are a result of the legacy of empire? Well, that's a really, really good question. And there are some problems today in the world that have got nothing at all to do with empires. Others that have got maybe an indirect relationship to the end of empires and the problems that that threw up. And some that have a very direct relationship. And I thought maybe it'd be useful to give you some examples of all three of these. So let's start with things that don't really have a, a link to the end of empires. I don't really think things like the pandemic or climate change really have a really direct relationship to empires, although they are some of the biggest problems we face. But some of the problems that do have maybe an indirect link to the end of empires uh, can relate to the shape of some countries' borders. I'll give you one example. Uh, in Africa, if you look at a map, a political map of Africa, you'll see some very straight lines in terms of the internal borders. And that's because as the European empires came to an end in Africa in the 1960s, it was the Europeans who drew the borders and then left rather than the local people. And as a result, you have some countries where certain ethnic groups or certain communities are split by the border, others that maybe don't have access to the sea or ports, others that do. But all this is because the local people didn't have ownership over the way that their countries uh, were created. And just one final example in terms of uh, problems that have in the modern world that have a really direct impact with the end of empire. There are still some wars and conflicts around the world in different parts of the world where the way that empires functioned and the way that they sometimes came apart quite dramatically and very inconclusively uh, have left some lingering problems. A couple of examples. Uh, you know that India and Pakistan have had difficulty in coming to a friendship, a lasting friendship, and they still have some disagreements over who controls which part of which uh, territory in Kashmir. This is a clear example of something that wasn't really handled so well as the British Empire came to an end. This is in partition in 1947. And as a result, it's been hard for these modern nations of India and Pakistan to come to some kind of agreement. And there are several of these sorts of conflicts and disagreements around the world that still have a very direct uh, legacy uh, connection to the era of empires. The negative effects of empire is often discussed. However, are there any positive effects that the world could draw upon to help address issues like poverty, climate change, injustice, and more? Oh, that's another really excellent question. I, I mean, you're right, there are so many negative things that are sometimes related back to the era of empires uh, in terms of some communities that suffered and other communities that maybe prospered much more at the expense of them. But I don't think we should be completely negative about it because the history of empires is really the history of the world that has, as it has developed until now. And you, you know that expression, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I think one really positive legacy of empire is the migration that's happened around the world. Uh, just imagine, you know, amongst yourselves and your classmates, how many of you have got uh, your roots, your family roots, stretching back a few generations, maybe to the right to the other side of the world. And think about some of the circumstances in which some of your more distant ancestors might have migrated. Sometimes it was because of difficulties in history. Sometimes it wasn't necessarily by choice. Sometimes it was a, some sort of a forced decision. Uh, certainly in my own family history, I know this very clearly. Um, but the fact that we have so many multi-ethnic countries now, where you have really rich collections of different communities and cultures all living side by side, some of that actually is because of empire. Some of it's because of the trading links that empires established. Sometimes it's because labourers were moved to work on projects that were being funded by an empire. All these sorts of things that when you delve into the history, you can start to understand. And I think you know, many of us living in Singapore can certainly agree that having a country in which you only have a single culture, single language, only one religious festival being celebrated. There are some countries that are like that, but I certainly think it's quite a rich thing to be living in a country where you have such a wide variety of cultures and people interacting. And let's never forget that sometimes the circumstances in which their ancestors moved uh, to that country might be very, very different to the circumstances that we have in the 21st century today, in a world after empires. The students attending this conference come from diverse countries and cultures and are affiliated to different identities and narratives at the same time. This can be confusing, especially at a time when identity politics can be seen everywhere. 
What advice would you give to students dealing with these issues? Well, this might be quite a personal issue for a number of students, and I can certainly uh, speak about my own background for a minute because it might be somewhat relatable. Uh, my family actually spans three continents across three generations. So, my great, my grandparents and great grandparents, everyone before that, they're from India, uh, from Punjab specifically, and my my family moved to Kenya in East Africa in the nineteen thirties and. And then, then after that, they moved to the UK in the 70s, and I was born in the 1980s in London. So you can see Asia, Africa, and Europe all there in my background. And uh, sometimes we get quite frustrated with the question that I get asked in Britain by some of my, my white British friends and colleagues. I say, well, where are you really from? And I think, well, how can I answer that question? Because, I mean, I was born in East London, so I sort of feel British, and my passport says British, and I sound pretty British. So surely the answer should be, I'm British. But sometimes people didn't necessarily believe it and always thought there must be some other trick answer to this in which I should actually be an immigrant or from somewhere else. And, and it's only later in life that I learned actually about the British Empire and the fact that the only reason my grandparents moved from Punjab to Kenya was because there was a big demand for cheap labour uh, and to build the railways which the British were constructing in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. And that's why my grandfather ended up getting this job he stayed in Nairobi, in Kenya's capital, uh, until the 80s. And in fact, quite relevant, he became a headmaster in a school in, in Kenya. Um, but I think for those of us who have quite mixed around backgrounds in terms of different experiences, different lineage from different parts of the world, I think it could be a real strength. Uh, because certainly when I wrote this book, I, I sort of took on board my own background and thought, well, I guess I can see the world from different perspectives. I can see the world from an Asian perspective, from an Indian perspective, culturally, but certainly also from a British and a Western perspective. And now I live in Singapore, which is great because I'm being exposed to another set of experiences, and in particular the influence of Chinese culture, which is so prevalent uh, here. So I think as you move through life, being able to draw upon different experiences, different chapters in your own life, from different parts, you'll find your own way of making all those parts work together, and of drawing the things that you find most inspirational for each of those parts, to make sense of the world, to make friends, and to navigate your own lives and your own careers and your own hobbies. Thank you, Dr. Puri. We will now hear from our Secretary General, Mihika Mishra. Honorable Directors, Fellow Secretary, esteemed guests, student officers, admins, and delegates. My name is Mihika Mishra, and it is my pleasure to serve as the Secretary General of the 12th Annual Middle Years Model United Nations Conference at Overseas Family School, Singapore. Over the last 12 years, Maimonovs has shared, shaped students and provided them with the experiences and exposure necessary to excel, not only in their MUN career, but also in all aspects of life. By providing us with the opportunity to attempt to resolve issues that are larger than us, MUN teaches us the importance of negotiation, collaboration, as well as acceptance of different values and beliefs. Whether it be developing the confidence to make your first speech, collaborating with new people on current global issues, or simply attentively listening during debate, Every aspect of MUN challenges us to be more open-minded and actively think of ways that we can better our world, therefore fostering development at both an individual and community le level. When we first started Maimonovs, we were a small conference with barely 50 delegates and fairly inexperienced chairs. Over the past 12 years, we've built our legacy while adapting to new challenges such as the pandemic and are now proud to announce the participation of over 300 delegates from all over the world in a newly adapted virtual format. This could not have been done without the hard work and dedication of our student officers, executive team, and most importantly, our MUN directors, Ms. Ucko and Ms. Pratt. As someone who initially started their MUN journey at this conference almost four years ago, it goes without saying that the knowledge and skills that I've learned here have sh truly shaped who I am today. If you told 12-year-old me, who was too nervous to even ask a POI at my first conference, that I would be standing here as a secretary general, I would have never believed you. However, it was the support and comforting environment in my monoffs that gave me just what I needed to push me in the right direction. So take that chance. Make your first POI, your first amendment, or even your first speech, and you may be surprised as to how far these little steps can take you. I'm grateful for the confidence, leadership, and values that I've gained through MUN. But most importantly, I'm grateful for the friendships that I've built through it. As the weekend starts, I challenge you to take full advantage of these opportunities that you are provided with and take those little steps to get the most out of this experience. I hope you learned something new and enjoy your time here at Maimonovs. 
And on that note, I declare the 12th annual Maimonov's Conference officially open. <laughs>